So I don't know if you know, but Building 7 was the third building that fell on 9-11. So there was the Twin Towers that they say two planes brought them down. And there was another building that a plane didn't hit, but it fell into its own footprint. Let me show you how it happened. So for the third time today, and watch this it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. And there it is. And that that's Dan Rather literally as it's as it's coming down, falling into its own footprint. He goes, well, those buildings look like they like when we see a building demolished on television, like it's coming down. I wonder why it looked like that. You know why? Because it was Wait, okay. Charlie Sheen. Hey, when he said looks to me. They, he was the same as Dan Rather, Charlie Sheen saying that? Yes. <laughs> Did they actually use the word brought down? And who was it that was telling you this? The fire department. The fire uh, th department. This is, and, uh, um, there it is. They These are all the different word. angles. Bring the, you see all the explosions? Down. So those are, those are all different angles of Building 7 coming down. Here's another one. Now, the interesting thing, here's another version. Here's another uh, angle. Now, if you think if you think that building fell into its own footprint because a, a plane hit another building, I've got a vaccine I'd like to sell you. So I just wanted to show you this was predicted. That was so BBC 20 minutes before that building fell. The BBC did this. Now, this is the only video I could get of it. I'm going to apologize for these graphics being there. But the BBC predicted they, they were at, they were broadcasting in real time, and they said that Building 7 had already fallen. They called it the Solomon Building because it was owned by this guy Solomon. So let's watch this. I heard a few moments ago I was talking about the Salomon Brothers building collapsing, and indeed it has. Apparently that's only a few hundred yards away from where the World Trade Center towers were. And it seems that this was not a result of a new attack. It was because the uh, building had been weakened uh, during uh, this morning's attacks. We'll probably find out more now about that from our correspondent, Jane Stanley. Jane, what more can you tell us about the Salomon Brothers building? Now, when they throw it to her... Building 7, the Solomon Brothers building, is still standing over her shoulder. And they're talking as if it had already fallen. So let's watch. Behind that, there's an empty piece of what was a very familiar New York skyline, a symbol of the financial prosperity of this city, but uh, completely disappeared is. now. And New York is still unable to take on board what has happened to them today. Presumably there were very few... So that was the BBC and on in real time on television telling you that the building seven had already fallen when it hadn't fallen yet. They didn't know what it was. So they didn't know what it was because they're from England. Right. So. Right. So watch this. So now this was a this is from Alaska. This is a news report debunking that. Well, it's been a point of controversy now for more than a decade. A researcher now from the University of Alaska Fairbanks is weighing in. World Trade Center Building 7 was not struck by a plane, but did collapse hours after the Twin Towers. Well, now the Dr. Leroy Holsey, a civil engineering professor at UAF, he led a four-year study which reevaluates whether Building 7's collapse could have been caused by fire, as was determined by the National Institute for Standards and Technology in 2008. Holsey says his findings were a resounding no, and his simulations paint a different picture than the federal agencies. So we virtually simulated the building, um, and then and we looked at that analysis, and we also virtually uh, simulated what they did. We couldn't get it to do what they were at. They they did. A group called Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth paid for the study. The organization is petitioning Congress to call for a new investigation into the World Trade Center destruction. A spokesperson for the organization says one of its supporters approached Dr. Halsey about the research, partly because of UAF's reputation. When we started talking to Dr. Halsey, it became very clear that, um, you know, the engineering program at University of Alaska Fairbanks was very strong. Uh, and Dr. Halsey was the chair of the department, and he had a lot of experience in modeling structures and doing forensic investigations, and so we thought it was a perfect opportunity for us to move forward. 
The study is now open for a two month public comment. So how bad is the a job has the establishment been doing? There's they've done so bad that even normies are looking into what really happened with Building 7. Every major narrative of the United States government is collapsing like Building 7. And let me bring on uh, Dr. Lerell Halsey. He is a professor emeritus of structural engineering at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, who has investigated the failure of the World Trade 7 building, Center Trade uh, 7 building, the third building to collapse on September 11th, 2001. A recent study from Dr. Halsey and his colleagues from the University of Alaska Fairbanks challenges the official explanation for World Trade Center 7's collapse. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. So now, let me. So you have impeccable reputation. Uh, they the 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 people who are interested in this came to you. Were you? Did you have your own? Just watching it on nine eleven. Did you have any doubt that it was happening the way that the establishment news was telling us it was happening? To be honest with you, I didn't even know a building seven had collapsed. Oh, really? Really? Okay. I did not know that. You know, and particularly when they st started telling me about this building, I said, you know, uh, I don't think I'm going to do this. So then they came back to me again, and I said, I don't think I'm going to do this. And then at, on the third time, I said, okay, I'll put together a proposal. I decided, okay, I'm old enough that if they take me out, it's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I just said, okay, and I put together a proposal, and and they accepted that proposal to do the work through the University of Alaska Fairbanks as a research project. So through that process, and I uh, went uh, and, and I, I got it funded. Then I looked at the normal way of doing things and looking for students to work with me. And I had a lot of undergraduate students that really, really were excited about it. But when they took it to their families, they decided they better not. They were a little worried. So then I ended up with two PhD students, both from China, and they worked with me. And, and they both are now teaching it in China. So, so go, ahead. go ahead. I'm sorry. So I just want to, so, so here is Building 7, and it's, as they said on the BBC, it's a few hundred yards away from the World Trade Center 1 and World Trade Center 2. So the idea that somehow uh, an explosion happening over here a few hundred yards away would somehow make that building fall into its own footprint is suspect, to say the least. Now, is there anything you want to say about this slide before I go to the next one? Well, I wanted, I wanted to, first of all, share with people exactly where Building 7 was with respect to WTC1 and WTC2. And this picture illustrates it in, in a in a in a, not necessarily in a dimensional sort of way, but a visual sort of way to give a person an understanding of, of look at this building's only 47 stories tall. I mean, and that's tall, quite frankly, 2 million square feet per floor. Wow. That's a big building. A big building. So in, in reality, uh, what I told the uh, AE 911 truth, who was funding this, I said, I'll, I'll do the investigation but I will not promise that I'll tell you what caused it. I will tell you what didn't cause it. Oh, okay. Okay. I did not want to. Here, here's the bottom line. There was no way I was going to get involved in any politics. This was going to be pure science all the way. Okay. And every, every day that we did a study, I asked my students, I hope you didn't read anything about this because we're not, we don't, not going to be, a fact we're not going to let anything that's being published affect the science that we're doing okay so next should i move on to the next slide yes so here it said it says w this the world trade center different elevation views there's the 45th floor the 19th 16th and 13th floor and so what do what do you want to tell people about this slide well first of all 45 is about where uh we saw that there wasn't any uh, there, you'll see here later that they're talking about the penthouse, uh -huh. which is on top of the building. And, and, and it came down before the rest of the building. And 
what we we spent a long, long time trying to determine what was going on with that penthouse because it had so much uh, interaction for a lot of people as to what went on on there, and a lot of people thought it it was connected, I, I guess, to building to uh, t- column forty seventy nine, which was down below. And in actuality, that penthouse collapsed before, which means that there there was not any fire that impacted that penthouse. Okay, so then one has to ask themselves what created that problem. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so you so, so, so when you look at the video of building 7 collapse, it collapses at the top first, not at yes. the bottom first, and Correct. you're saying there was no fire up on the 45th floor. No. Okay. So, you know, that that opens up a whole series of questions, does it not? Yes. You know, at the end of the beginning so so anyway, I'm done with this. I just wanted to show in also at 1916 and 13 or 50. What is that? 1916 and 13. Yeah. So we did a lot of work on floor 13 because this did, and 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 so then the question is is where did the where did all this start to occur that we see in these videos? Okay. So now we can go on. I just I'm trying okay. to give a, people a bit of an understanding. Right. There's a lot of people that ask. What was in that building? Well, this slide shows us by floor, floor by floor. So uh, on the top, it was mechanical floors that I guess the workings for the building. Then Solomon Smith Barney was on 28 to 25. Then there was Standard Chartered Bank. Then there was the IRS, Department of Defense and Central Intelligence Agency on, on floor 25, 24. And on 23 was the Office of Emergency Management. On 22 was the Federal Home Loan Bank of New York. On the 21st was the First State Management Group. Um, from 19 to 21 was ITT Harvard, Hartford Insurance Group. On floor 19 was the National Association of Oobsy Rabsy Commission. I don't know what that, that's a Securities Valuation Office. 18 was the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Floors 14 through 17 were vacant. But on third on eleven through thirteen was the Security and Exchange Commission and the Provident Financial Management, and then just below that was the U.S. Secret Service, and then the American Express Bank. And now, what is the what is the significance of that that is highlighted here in yellow? What is highlighted is the Security and Exchange Commission and the Provident Financial Management. What what is the significance of that? Because there was a fire there. Oh, that's where the fire was. So so why not? Ask yourself, okay, if this is so important, how much paperwork is going to be laying around? So at the end of the day, we have to be confident that those, that, that those documents were locked up every day. If you, if, you, if you put it on that question, just that question alone, the probability of a fire – propagating and it didn't propagate very fast through that whole system. I mean, we're talking about hours here of hardly any fire at all. So then the question is, is okay, what's going on there? So I highlighted it just to pose a question of thought. So you'd think they would have sprinkler systems. It would be really um, tightly managed. It's a really important uh, top secret kind of stuff. And they wouldn't allow it to just be susceptible to a fire. Well, no, is, is what you're no, saying. Yeah. No, they wouldn't. And even if it was a fire, if it was the other condition, and they did, the fire indications that are that they uh, they didn't scatter around. So what what's what was the uh, I guess the conditions for the uh, supp- uh, what what am I trying to say? I'm I'm, I'm concerned about. What was the fuel for cre- uh, keeping the fire burning? So you're saying, yeah, what was, they, they say office furniture. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> it was all blue spruce. <laughs> <laughs> okay, should I go to the next slide? Oh, yeah, of course. You bet. So this is from your study, and this is the, uh, this is, I guess, a, a mock-up of the building, of this building. This is the actual building, and, and- this is your mock-up. Yeah, I, and looking at it earlier today, I was thinking, you know, I should have made it the same width in, in terms of the people talking, uh, looking at it. Right. But basically, this is this is the structure, and it's um, 
broken down by two different computer programs to simulate precisely the erection of that building. And so when, when we look at this for a moment here, we're going to see that it begins to collapse. And we're going to compare my work against the actual footage that occurred that day. Okay, so let's watch that. So here's what actually happened. Wow, you can see the penthouse collapse first. Which Absolutely, on both. Which doesn't make any sense, but here we go. Okay, so do you want to say anything about that? I just wanted to put this out here for this discussion to, sh to let people under see um, how well we were able to compare our work in relation to what happened that day. Okay, so next slide. Yes. Okay, so now uh, here's another mock-up. Uh, the, this is the this is the National Institute for for what? National Institute of Standards and Technology. So NIST. this this is their simulation. We're going to show now. Is that it? That is correct. Against this actual footage on our left. Okay, let's watch. So this is the, how it actually fell down, and here's what they said happened. Well, that's not what happened at all. So this is what they're saying happened, and we can see that's not what happened. Correct. So they, so just like the, I don't, uh, the vaccine came, of, you know, from a pangolin. Uh, I mean, the 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 virus, and then they got printed in Nature magazine. This is a con job. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff has turned out to be a con job just across the board in academia, like psychology. A big yeah. one turned out to be a big scam. Puts so, people in faking stuff for a while. So this, so this looks like, so this doesn't have any resemblance to what we just saw. Correct? No. It doesn't. Okay. And 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 more than and more important than that, NIST basically is in position to make sure that when we put up buildings, that they we have a code that protects the public. My profession is to ensure that when we design something, it's going to be there and it's going to stay and not hurt anybody. This this is a remarkable. I mean, when the code doesn't get changed, and you're saying it, all this stuff is happening. It just makes no sense. Yeah. So you're saying that a, a fire made this building collapse like this, and they didn't change the code afterwards. No, not in regards to the safety or any of that kind of stuff. If okay. they're going to say it, there's got to be a change. Right to mo to improve it, but there's never been another steel building in the world that has come down because of fire. N never is that right? Especially in its own footprint. So yeah. here's a, here's the next, and this is um, so this is still the NIS uh, NIST. This yeah, and what I want to say about that is that they simulated to the right of this picture on my left, uh, basically the the connections of the columns to the beams, but they didn't on the left. So there's a difference. So you're saying here they connected to the columns to the beams, but they didn't hear? No, they made an assumption. Okay. It's what's called pinned or fixed. And so that's between the two. And you'll see on this picture when it's coming down, that that line represents the two differences. Okay. Which doesn't represent the building. Let's watch. Okay. So this is your study, and here's the actual footage. Let's watch. So now what does that show us? It shows it's coming down in its own footprint. It's showing it's coming down in free fall. It's showing that there is something that enables it to come down evenly in other words through through its own gravity right drop okay and fall into its own footprint correct and mine is, simulates the same thing to within you know I, I didn't drop it all the way down but I, right but anyway it represents <coughs> what we're talking about and so should okay. I go next slide hell yeah okay so here's this is your study and this is the actual footage. <laughs> Before we jump, 
look at the upper left of that. See that? Right that here? That was the penthouse coming down. So that's the, so. this is what actually happened? Through the 45th floor. That's why I had that 45 in there. Okay. That's way above any reported fires. And so, so that, that wasn't a fire. That wasn't a fire. It doesn't make any sense. No. And so, and then it just falls straight down. Right. Now, I probably ought to tell you something about the building. If we look down on top of it, that building is not a rectangle. It's got basically a trapezoidal kind of shape. And I don't know if I put a picture in there to, to discuss that for a moment or not, but uh, I, I think I may have. Let, let's go on. If not, is it it's an picture? important is it this, Yeah. Okay. Let's. There we go again. Same idea. So, yep. <laughs> it sounds like they're looking at your graph. <laughs> whoa, whoa, that one. <laughs> So well, that, there, there, there's been another study by a uh, physicist who also has done an evaluation of free fall. And my calculations fall right on top of his, his verification of and so how there, it dropped. So the fact that it fell at free fall speed is significant because that means that there, it, that there was absolutely no resistance in the, right. in, in the building structure and no steel beams, which doesn't make any sense, correct, that there wouldn't be any resistance because the whole building wasn't on fire. There was just a part of the building. So that part would get weakened, but not the part below it and certainly not the part up in the penthouse. So that for, for that to fall in free fall doesn't make any sense, correct? Correct. And so why do you think the NIST said that it, that it did make sense? Well, I'm not going to go there. Okay. Because, All right. <laughs> okay. You yeah. know, it, because. Uh, All you can say is it didn't. Like, why did they say why that? Why did they say it? that? Right. Okay. So want to go to the next slide? Here's this one. Sure. Yeah. So this is the study for progressive collapse. So I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll now, play. Now I'm, go ahead. One of the findings that I came up with, I said, <laughs> we spent a year playing around with this whole idea of did this piece break? Did that piece break? Did this piece uh, have problems in the other piece, which would have developed what's called a progressive collapse. We determined without a doubt that that did not happen. A global collapse happened. So everything that you looked at so far was a global collapse. Came straight down, the whole structure. Yeah. <coughs> which has never happened before or since in a steel building. No, uh, has correct. never ever happened, but it happened three times. Three times on September eleventh, two thousand one. To one building that what wasn't a, hit by a plane at to all. To one building that wasn't <laughs> even hit by a plane. What a coinky dink, huh? So I probably need to tell you something that really has bothered me lately. Uh, is that if that's okay with you? Sure. You think I should dye my hair? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I I, re I just so about uh, two years ago. I, I was contacted by email by a firefighter out of New York who was there that day. And he said, is it okay to contact you? And I said, here's my telephone number. Call me. And so we spent about two hours on the phone, and I learned an awful lot about what happened that day because he was in the building when, for, for quite a while. And he brought something forth that I have – dealt with for some time now and I don't know the answer to the question but I sure would like to know and that had nothing to do with what I did but it had everything to do with what happened that day so he was there in, in that building and I don't remember which floor he was at then it, when he was telling me the story but there was a, a gentleman in there that was measuring the amount of movement of the building Every few minutes. And I'm, I'm saying, is that, was that an engineer? Was that a structural engineer? Or who, who was it? I, to this day, I still don't know who was doing it. It might have been a firefighter, but it's not a typical kind of thing that I would visualize a firefighter to, to do unless it's large structural systems on the outside of the building and they're, they're worrying about it falling off and hitting people below. I don't know. But anyway... The fire marshal came up and said, this building's coming down shortly. 
everybody out of here. And I'm, we want to be down on the on the on the corner of the corner where there's a, a restaurant. And they all met there and watched the building come down. How did they know? Well, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Yeah. So I, I have been wanting to for some time have a conver- have a meeting with the fire everybody that feels comfortable to have a meeting from the firefighters because you know they they went through so much i mean they had loved ones they had friends they had people that uh have died already because of the inf- the situation they were in it's all kinds of issues and i don't want to drag them through that but i sure would love to be able to understand what they went through that day and the police force at a, at a, at a level that has not been brought out yet. I feel like the American people deserve it. And I don't want to drag them through anything they don't want to be drugged through. But at the same time, I sure would, if they would be happy to participate, I would be happy to help them participate. So I've seen videos of firemen saying that there were large explosions, um, not only in Building 7, but World Trade Center 1 and 2, that felt like they were coming from the basement, that it knocked them off their feet. Um, and so, You hear that, for sure. And so, so I know you didn't study. I, I, I had this thought uh, the other day as I was walking out of Burbank Airport if the when the planes hit World Trade Center one and two and it hit it like in the middle of the building and let's say it did melt that steel, well, wouldn't just the top of the building fall over? Why would the steel underneath it all of a sudden lose all structural integrity and collapse at free fall speed? That does does that make sense to you as an engineer? No, no, no. So and why doesn't why do you think more people haven't questioned that? You know, I don't know. I, I will tell you this, that um, when those two buildings start coming down, uh, the AS, the, the engineering ASC, I think it was, came out and said, this is a f- collapse by uh, like f- flat plates hitting, bang, 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 right. coming down. Okay. That was the argument. I when that argument came out, I was teaching structural engineering at UAF, and I turned around to my students and I said, "That simply is not true." Well, that's the whole idea is like let's say let's give them the benefit of the doubt that the jet fuel, fuel burned hot enough to melt that steel. Well, why would the buildings above where that the planes and the fire happened? Why would the this floors above it, why would it lose all its structural integrity too? Just like in Building 7, when the penthouse lost its structural integrity, even though there was no fire up there, the same thing with Building 1 and 2, why would it collapse? Why would it just kind of fall over? Because it's like if you take out the knees of something, it doesn't go down like that. It, it would it would go over like this or like that. Well, absolutely, absolutely. So here's the other thing. How, uh, at the end of the day, this building was struck, uh, the Twin Towers, one and two, was struck by planes. Yet, if you take a look at a plane and its resistance to any, any structural system, such as they're light gauge steel. I mean, I've been told that things like ice and, and things in the air can do a lot of damage to the the hull of that that plane. That being the case, what do you have going into that building? You've got speed. You've got a structure that's significantly less because it, it's been designed to be light to begin with. And the, and the, and the, the structural engineer designed these buildings to resist fi- a, a plane hitting it. That's right. They So people don't know that. They actually constructed w- World Trade Center 1 and 2 to be able to withstand a jet flying into it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so all of that adding up, and then there's other kinds of things that we've, we've heard recently. And there's a book out by one of the former uh, of flight attendants that was, was scheduled to go out that day. And 
and, and there's all kinds of things. Uh, and and there's there's also discussions. I don't know what where where the truth is. I mean, I haven't done any studies on some of this about the fact that there were no people in that in those planes. It was all done by remote. And and if that's the case, and that was what was written by this flight attendant. That and that that brings me to a place that I, it breaks my heart that all these people were actually on the ground instead of up in the air. And I mean, that, that was bad enough, but the, on the ground. And then we've never heard from them since that, that really, 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 really bothers me. You think they wouldn't just let the people be killed? <laughs> like, they, <laughs> like they'd really go to the trouble of not killing the innocent people. Right. I know. So, but so th that doesn't, that doesn't uh, make my happiness about our country. Very, right. very good. Yeah, that's understandable. <laughs> well, you know, they didn't launch an investigation into what happened on 9-11 until about two years after 9-11. And then when George Bush and Dick Cheney testified, they testified in secret behind closed doors and all they had to be together. George Bush couldn't be by himself. <laughs> and, they, and there was no transcript of it. And they were not under oath. Why would they do so? And nobody, you're not allowed to ask questions about any of these things because they'll call you a truther or they'll call you a crazy person. But it, you know, it was just like with the Seth Rich investigation. Uh, I remember I was on a news show called The Young Turks, and at the time they billed themselves as the biggest online news show in the world. And I asked uh, Ben Mankiewicz, who the uh, the host of the Turner Classic Movies, and Jenk Uger. Uh, I said, can you either of you remember the last time reporters weren't allowed to ask questions about an unsolved murder investigation by the FBI? And they didn't know what to say to me because, though, there was never was before and there never has been since. You can ask questions about the Kennedy assassination, Robert Kennedy. You can ask questions about anything, any open murder investigation where they don't know who did it. But you couldn't ask questions about Seth Rich. And why was that? Because they didn't want you to. Because if you did, you're going to find out that something they didn't want you to find out. And now we know, now years later, we know that the the, uh, the FBI actually has the laptop of Seth Rich. They first lied and said they didn't have it. Then they lied and said they couldn't get the data. Then they lied and said they had the data. But now they have the data. They're not going to release it for 65 years. <laughs> So it's the same thing. So when you're not allowed to ask questions about something and they shame you for asking questions, just like during COVID, just like during Seth Rich, just like 9-11, they're hiding something. And when you have to when the president of the United States and the vice president have to testify about what happened uh, during the biggest terrorist attack in the history of our country and they have to do it in secret, not under oath and off the record behind closed doors. That should raise a red flag for everybody. But again, because the media is consolidated, and if you ask those questions, their attack dogs will come after you and try to discredit you and ruin your career. And that's why you had to, you were able to do this because you're at the end of your career. And what could they do to you? You already got, you know, you already got your pension. So um, thank God for that, I guess. Um, Kurt, you wanted to say yeah, something? So uh, the thing that always makes me laugh, you bring about Rumsfeld announcing they, they can't find $2 trillion. So the, the, that was yeah. the day before this. So the day before this happened, he announced it. Here's the Secretary yeah. of Defense g gave a press conference where he said that they could not account for two trillion, not billion, not million, two trillion dollars. And the irony is, or the d damn the luck, the coincidence is that the plane that su supposed plane that hit the Pentagon hit the office where they were trying to figure out where all that money went. So, Kurt <laughs> so this is the AP. Uh, the Reuters is, a, is a good for a laugh as well. The debunking of that. Okay. Ready? See if you can pick out where it's gone wrong already. No, the U.S. government didn't mysteriously lose trillions of dollars the day before 9-11. Yeah, I thought they lost it all just that day. Right. <laughs> that's what they're debunking. <laughs> Not the actual thing that they still can't account for, by the way. And you don't think there was some accounting? Th From what I could see, there was some accounting being done in that Building 7 that collapsed. Yes, in Building 7, there was the Securities and Exchange Commission and in there, and the CIA, and all that stuff got destroyed, so they could never look up those records. I didn't think they lost it in one day, like Brewster's That's right. Millions. That's right. Story Richard Pryor. <laughs> hey, let's... Well, uh, you know, that's another reason why I uh, put that slide in there for us to take a look at what was on those floors. Right. Because that brings to point 
wonder what really went on there. And then you go back to Oklahoma and something very similar on those floors. And you have to wonder, you know. Oh, no. so you're talking about what Timothy McVeigh. Yes. Yes. So there's, that's also very sketchy. They're very, very sketchy. There was a second car. There was a second bomber, a second car. There's a lot of things. I just want to play this. And uh, I didn't have time to sure. load it into my keynote, but let me see. Let's I'll just play it. It's five minutes long. On the morning of September 11, 2001, 19 men armed with box cutters directed by a man on dialysis in a cave fortress halfway around the world using a satellite phone and a laptop directed the most sophisticated penetration of the most heavily defended airspace in the world, overpowering the passengers and the military combat trained pilots on four commercial aircraft before flying those planes wildly off course for over an hour without being molested by a single fighter interceptor. These 19 hijackers, devout religious fundamentalists who like to drink alcohol, snort cocaine, and live with pink-haired strippers, managed to knock down three buildings with two planes in New York. While in Washington, a pilot who couldn't handle a single-engine Cessna was able to fly a 757 in an 8,000-foot descending 270-degree corkscrew turn to come exactly level with the ground, hitting the Pentagon in the budget analyst office where DOD staffers were working on the mystery of the $2.3 trillion that Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld had announced missing from the Pentagon's coffers in a press conference the day before, on September 10th, 2001. Luckily, the news anchors knew who did it within minutes. Osama bin Laden. The pundits knew within hours. Osama bin Laden. The administration knew within the day. Terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbored them. And the evidence literally fell into the FBI's lap. That a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. But for some reason, a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists demanded an investigation into the greatest attack on American soil in history. That investigation was delayed, underfunded, set up to fail, a conflict of interest, and a cover-up from start to finish. It was based on testimony extracted through torture, the records of which were destroyed. It failed to mention the existence of WTC-7, Able Danger, p -Tech, Sibel Edmonds, OBL and the CIA, and the drills of hijacked aircraft being flown into buildings that were being simulated at the precise same time that those events were actually happening. It was lied to by the Pentagon, the CIA, the Bush administration, and as for Bush and Cheney, well, no one knows what they told it because they testified in secret, off the record, not under oath, and behind closed doors. It didn't bother to look at who funded the attacks because that question is ultimately of little practical significance. <clears throat> Still, the 9-11 Commission did brilliantly answering all of the questions the public had, except most of the victim's family members' questions, and pinned blame on all the people responsible, although no one so much as lost their job, determining the attacks were failure of imagination. Because... Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings. Except the Pentagon, FEMA, NORAD, and the NRO. The DIA destroyed 2.5 terabytes of data on Able Danger, but that's okay because it probably wasn't important. The SEC destroyed their records on the investigation into the insider trading before the attacks, All but that's right. okay because destroying the records of the largest investigation in SEC history is just part of routine record keeping. <laughs> NIST has classified the data that they used for their model of WTC7's collapse, but that's okay because knowing how they made their model of the collapse would jeopardize public safety. The FBI has argued that all material related to their investigation of 9-11 should be kept secret from the public, but that's okay because the FBI probably has nothing to hide. This man never existed, nor is anything he had to say worthy of your attention, and if you say otherwise, you are a paranoid conspiracy theorist and deserve to be shunned by all of humanity. Likewise him, 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 and her, and her, and her, and him. Osama bin Laden lived in a cave fortress in the hills of Afghanistan, but somehow got away. Then he was hiding out in Tora Bora, but somehow got away. Then he lived in Abbottabad for years, taunting the most comprehensive intelligence dragnet employing the most sophisticated technology in the history of the world for a decade, releasing video after video with complete impunity and getting younger and younger as he did so, before finally being found in a daring SEAL team raid which wasn't recorded on video, in which he didn't resist or use his wife as a human shield, and in which these crack special forces operatives panicked and killed this unarmed man, supposedly the best source of intelligence about those dastardly terrorists on the entire planet. Then they dumped his body in the ocean before telling anyone about it. Then a couple dozen of that team's members died in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan. This is the story of 9-11, brought to you by the media which told you the hard truths about His head could be seen to move violently forward. And They took the babies out of incubators. And Mobile production facilities. And The rescue of Jessica Lynch. If you have any questions about this story, you are a batshit, paranoid, tinfoil, dog-abusing baby hater and will be reviled by everyone.
If you love your country and or freedom, happiness, rainbows, rock and roll, puppy dogs, apple pie, and your grandma, you will never ever express doubts about any part of this story to anyone. Ever. Well, I didn't. This has been a public service announcement by the friends of the F. Okay. So. Wow. I would have told you to shut up uh, how 20 years ago. So I know the guy who put that together is James Corbett, and he got kicked off YouTube. For this? I don't know. I'm sure it didn't help. Um, I don't know what they what they used to kick him off, but they did. They showed Richard Gage on there. That's that dude from uh, Grand Theft World. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, he has a lot more of those kind of videos uh, about 9-11. He has one about um, uh, Oklahoma, the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, that lot, so many things don't add up and make sense. But again, you're not allowed to ask these questions. I would have brushed it all on, aside had it not been for the same goddamn play. You know, if they at the very least didn't try to use domino theory every year of my life, as long as I've been alive, <laughs> the thing that didn't work back before I was born, do right. we keep doing for this? Vietnam, yeah. I would never notice it. It's just like you, even a dullard can see a pattern. You, well, I guess. I guess you'd think. So... um I really appreciate you coming on. Is there is there anything else? Uh, I mean, so I I we we're not denying that the, that there was a horrible event that happened on nine eleven or that those buildings fell down and thousands of people were killed. We're not denying any of it. We're saying that you know who's really responsible, who's the culpable, how did it actually happen? Because Building Seven didn't come down the way they said it did. And I mean, if you just look at it from a, a engineering viewpoint, it didn't happen. There's no reason why the the penthouse would come down first. That doesn't make sense. That a, and again, before or said, even Rosie O'Donnell. Uh, I have a video of Rosie O'Donnell mm-hmm. questioning this on the View from like fifteen years ago. Before she got her wow. mind right. Before she got her mind She's right. A much happier person now. I don't know if you've seen her clips. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, go ahead, do- Doctor. I was going to say. I think there's a couple other videos that I put on here and one of them shows it collapsing at an uh, falling over oh, okay. as a progressive collapse I, I thought we probably ought to tell share a little bit about that so later. let's watch this i think this is and now you you're saying this is how it should have fell down i'm saying if you use what nist says happened and i had the nist yeah this is what would have happened okay so. i didn't say that in my report but the fact of the matter is if a column over here on the on the edge of the building, like column 79 comes out and those around it comes out first, then they lose support, but the others are still there. So why is it going to stand straight up and come down in its own footprint? It's not going to happen that way. So if, if, if it happened the way they said it, this is how it would go. look. Okay, let's more watch. like it. Yes. So this is how it would look. And if you, if you begin to see the top of it, of this course. is not a rectangular building. Right. This is, and so the stiffness of it is not in like a rectangle. There's, there's parts of it that are heavier than others and all that kind of stuff that's going on. The stiffest part of this building is at the elevator shafts in the middle of it, the building. NIST argues the the portion of the building to your right, if you're looking into it, is the exterior. And they, they said that that's really, really stiff and everything pushed from there. Not true. Actually, it's less stiff than the centroid of the building where the elevator shafts are. So there, you're saying when you see the building fall like this into itself, they're saying that's because the edges of the building were the stiffest. You're saying that's not true, that the core of the building was the stiffest where the elevator shafts were. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the first thing we looked at. We said, okay, where's the centroid of this building? Where is the, uh, what I would call the thermal centroid of the building? In other words, if you heat something up, just imagine if you take a piece of steel and you have it, Uh, and you hold it on one end, and you heat it up, it's going to move away from that where you're holding it because it's stiffer there. Right. You hold it on the other end now and set it on fire, and it's going to go the other way because that's the stiffest point. Anywhere else in between, if you're wherever you're holding it, that's the stiffest point. 
the stiffest point for the heating up the floor system was close to that centro- thermal centroid, which was near the elevator shaft. And so, uh, go, ahead. go ahead. And so, I just want to ask you, but, but you know, your your colleagues. I mean, you're a well respected. You were the head of the department. You had a great reputation. What has been the fallout of you doing this study and proving that this could not have happened the way the NIST said it happened? Well, I guess we'll have to find out, won't we? I mean, you've had, but you've done this study, right? I mean, it's been out for a while. Yeah. yeah. What, what, well, year, what year did you release this study? Well, I think it was uh, 2000 and I think it was in 2020, something like that. <clears throat> okay. You know, but anyway, uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, I don't know. I, I know that, uh, I know that, uh, the vice president is well aware of what I did. You mean Dick Cheney? Yes. Well, that's you, all good. That's that. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's that guy's pretty evil. He's got a lot of connections. Um, and so, do you fear that someone will uh, try to do something to you? Like, like who knows? Maybe an IRS investigation or something. What do you think would happen? I don't know. You know, I, I, I believe in. I'm a Christian and I believe in God. And if I'm, I'm going to do the best I can for the people of this country. And that's, and if I have to suffer for it, that so be it. And so you're doing this as a service, obviously it's not, this isn't a money maker for you. This is a career ender for people. No, I'm doing it. I'm doing it because I feel like the people deserve better. Okay. And, uh, I guess I'm going to find out what's going to happen to me. Um, <laughs> So we'll see. We probably won't be a, another Bohemian invitation. <laughs> well, well, I have I have friends all over the world. So okay, you know, at the end of the day, it's uh, I I don't I don't go out and tr- try to create uh, issues every day, but when I see an opportunity like this, I'm going to at least present what I think is the truth, and and what and let the other situation uh be addressed so that 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 local television station covered it did you get invitations to go on other local tv shows or any other any other news organizations ever invite you on to talk about it 60 minutes nightline anybody no 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 interesting very interesting But, but i did get invitations from uh engineering uh that was in alaska I got invitation for uh, doing it in Arizona, like an engineering uh, conference. Yeah, yes, or engineering meetings, you know, uh-huh. that kind of stuff, where I shared what I had, so that the engineers would have some understanding of where I came from with all of this. Um, and and there's an organization in uh, uh, in the UK now that's looking at what we did, and uh, we'll see where that all goes. Uh, so anyway, I, I don't know how to address the question you just gave me about, uh, not being invited to televisions and okay. uh, you know, sets and all that. I don't know why. Um, I, t- I tend to think that they are not always on the truth side. Right. Of course, because they're owned by the people uh, who want to control the narrative, right? Those there's yes. in, especially in the United States, there's only six major corporations that control every news show, every television show, every radio show, every newspaper. The mass media is owned by six companies. And uh, and that was engineered by Bill Clinton in the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And so ever since then, all the people who are in media know that they, they have very few places to go work. And so it became very homogenized and it became very easy to do all those wars. And so they used 9-11 as a pretext to go into Syria, to go into Libya, to go into Afghanistan for 20 years, uh, to go. And, 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 and by the way, uh, and Libya and those, as Julian Assange told us, those wars are not to be won. Those wars are be, meant to be ongoing. Because it is a money laundering organiz- uh, operation 
to sure. take money from the treasury and disperse it through the international security state and the military industrial complex and the billionaires who own that stuff. So that that's what we've been living. I mean, we keep pretending that it's um, ISIS that are the terrorists, but the United States had killed a million people in Iraq. Uh, look what we did in Libya. Same thing. And the most successful state in Africa, we turned it into a failed state. Uh, look what we did in Syria. We got in bed with ISIS and Al Qaeda in Syria to try to, and that was all for a pipeline. And we just, we still occupy a third of Syria. As we wag our finger at Putin uh, for going into the eastern part of Ukraine to stop Ukraine from shelling the Russian ethnics there, uh, he invaded Ukraine not to start a war, but to end one. And we're occupying Syria, which is right. We just built two military bases inside someone else's country. And which third of Syria are we occupying? We're occupying the oil part. Absolutely. And so this has been never ending. And then Den uh, General uh, Wesley Clark revealed on uh, Democracy Now! that he went into the Pentagon after 9-11 and they already had a plan to go into Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, Libya, and I think there was two more, uh, Somalia, and I think there's uh, Afghanistan. And so they've done most of those. The, the, the last ones are, I think, Lebanon and, and Iran are the ones that are left on the list. And uh, they're trying to do that right now. They're trying to engineer uh, a war with Iran and uh, Lebanon, and they're trying to do it through uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict. They're saying that uh, Hamas was funded by Iran, and that gives us. To, and if any if any proxies of Iran attack U.S. soldiers, that's an attack from Iran. And so we'll. So that this has been. Uh, <clears throat> there's a there's a document called the uh, Prospect for a New American Century, and it laid out all this. And they said they needed a big night. They needed a a Pearl Harbor, so they could use that as a pretext. So what they gave. The president of the United States was called the AUMF, which is the Authorization for Use of Military Force. And that means he didn't have to declare a war if he wanted to go into Libya. He didn't have to declare a war to go into Iraq or Syria or Afghanistan. They'd have to declare a war, get Congress to declare a war. He could do that because under the guise of him fighting, under the president fighting terrorism. So we've done all these wars without an official declaration of war. And it's just we are, are the world's terrorists that there's no other country that has done what we've done in the last 20 years or even come close. Yeah, uh, it's really unfortunate. And to say the know. least, and we have over 800 military bases, I say probably a thousand military bases around the world. No one comes close to that. And right. uh, most, you know, a lot of them are secret also, but. Anyway, I really appreciate your courage, uh, doctor, and I appreciate you coming on the show. And I appreciate you, you know, sharing your knowledge of engineering and your impeccable reputation and putting it on the line to tell the truth about something like this. And, you know, uh, the idea that you're not allowed to ask questions in the United States of America about anything uh, should be a red flag to everybody. But what they do is they go, oh, you're just asking questions. Are you one Wait, of those? What are these guys? What are these guys? Oh, are just, just asking I'm questions. I'm just asking questions. What else are you supposed to do? <laughs> That's what you're supposed what do you to mean do. Just Ju just asking questions. <laughs> I know. You know that's a hostile <laughs> act. Yeah. Let me share something else with you before we go. Okay. This is it doesn't have to be on the air. So one of the things that happened almost at the very beginning. Well, we, I just want to let you know we are on the air. We're live. Okay, that's that's fine. Okay. okay. So so at the very beginning, uh, when when the building went down, these all three buildings went down. Uh, what did what happened immediately after that? They looked at they looked as fast as they could to get all that stuff hauled away. That's right. That is not the way you handle and anything that collapses. I mean, I'm a I've done a lot of building collapse eva or evaluation of failures, and the first thing you do is you put it back together, or you you examine the what may have created the problem. But if you don't have the material there, and why didn't you have the material there, then you're violating the very issue that you should be using to, to, to make a determination of what truly did happen. And so, yet in the dust particles, they found thermite they that found was unexploded. 
So thermite is uh, an explosion, explosive oh that, they, that they use to, to implode buildings, correct? Well, yeah. I mean, it can certainly take the temperature up to about 2,700 degrees F. I mean, it's pretty, or I'm not exactly sure about that number, but it's pretty high. It's to the point that if you look at the what happened in the rumble piles, uh, that was not a typical fire. Right. So well, I appreciate you. Uh, yeah, that's exactly they, they did the exact opposite of what the you're supposed to do, and they also their investigation uh, did the exact opposite of what you're supposed to do. You're you're supposed to do it out in the open. They did yeah. it behind closed doors in secret, and it wasn't under oath, and it wasn't recorded, and it there was it, it's just crazy. Uh, Absolutely, so it everything says there there's a cover up, and you are you aren't being told the truth, and the first thing they had to do was. Uh, make sure that anybody who had a question about it was called a crazy and a truther. A truther. They turned the word truth into a... That's so Orwellian. They turned <laughs> the word truth into a negative. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So... That's yeah, just crazy. Yeah. All right. Well, but, we have to move along. I really appreciate you again coming on. Uh, Dr. Leroy Holsey did great work at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and debunking the official story of how Building 7 came down. It, uh, according to you and your research, and you have impeccable reputation, it didn't come down the way the establishment and the government said. realize it was another building for many years. <laughs> well, I, right. I thought no, two no, buildings kidding. went down and for you, most of that time. Most people didn't know there was a third building that came down. Why is it called That's Building right. 7 if it's the third one? Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Doesn't, Sorry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks again. I appreciate it. And uh, if I remember up in uh, Fairbanks, I'll look you up. Thanks. I've appreciate been up there it. twice. Oh, you have? Yeah, awesome. I, did, I did a New Year's Eve gig in Fairbanks. It was, uh, and why do you, why was I up there for New Year's? Because I have that good of an agent. And um, <laughs> it was 42 below when I was there. 42 below. And uh, the joke I wrote about it, you know, when it has to warm up 70 degrees just to freeze, that's cold. <laughs> Anyway, so when you go back, go up there in July. Okay, yeah, I'll try to do it. All right, doctor, <laughs> we got to run. We're way behind, but thank you so thank much. Thank you. Okay, yeah, you bet. You Let's, take care. We're doing live comedy shows in Oxnard, California, Venice, California, Palmdale, California, Omaha, Nebraska, Des Moines, Milwaukee, Lansing, Michigan, Bend, Oregon, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, and Boston. Plus, we're going to put a date in Edmonton, Canada, plus Vancouver. See ya. Go to jimmydoor.com for a link for all those tickets. Mm -hmm.